So, welcome to lesson number three. Previous lesson, we did uh, interference. Now we're moving on and did another important topic. And the important topic is called diffraction. Now let me explain diffraction like this. There's a wave. What kind of wave is it? Could be a water wave. Let's say it's a water wave for now, but it could be a light wave or a sound wave. And the wavelength, of course, the distance from crest to crest. Now, let me actually display that wave in a slightly different way. So what I'm going to do is, let's say I'm in a helicopter and I'm looking down on top of that wave. Well, what I'm going to see are the tops of the waves or the crests. So I'm going to draw the crest going like that. Everywhere I see crest. I'm drawing a wave like this. So I'm looking down on top of it. So when you look down on top of it, that's what you're seeing as in the top of the wave. Then what happens? It goes down and then comes up. A little bit like a corrugated roof. I mean I could put in the troughs. Sometimes you'll see this in books. Put the trough in between so there is a broken line with the trough in between. But you know what? I'm not going to keep drawing the troughs. You get the idea. So the wave comes out of the board, into the board, and so on. We're, we're looking down on top of it. So there's a water wave traveling along, minding its own business, and then it comes to an obstacle. And when it comes to an obstacle, part of it is going to get blocked. And what actually happens? Well, the wave is going to travel out, going to travel out like that. What about the rest of the wave? Well, the rest of the wave will get blocked. But you know, are you going to see this? Are you going to see a wave travelling here and right beside this wave you're going to have totally calm water? Well, not really. You know the way the water waves go? The molecules bop up and down and when they bop up and down they will attract water molecules close by. So, these water molecules that are bopping up and down, they're going to attract ones beside them. So there's going to be a little bit of curvature around behind the obstacle. See that spreading around behind corners? That's what we call diffraction. Diffraction is about waves spreading around corners or through gaps. That's an important definition. You can see that definition at the top of page 46. Diffraction is the spreading of waves around corners. I mean, for example, sound diffracts because you can hear around corners. Now let's develop it a little bit further. So here I go again. Here's my water wave. Remember these are the crests. So the distance from crest to crest, there is the wavelength. And I'm going to pass it through an obstacle with a little gap in it. So there is an obstacle with a gap in it. Now look at the size of the gap. It's quite big actually compared to the wavelength. I'm going to call the size of that gap. I'm going to call that D. You can see in this particular example, D is a lot bigger than the wavelength. So I'm going to write down D. A lot bigger, greater than, greater than, wavelength. Now, what happens? Well, that wave passes through. Any wave behind the obstacle will get blocked off. So the wave passes through, but once again, you wouldn't expect to see a nice high wave there and right beside it totally calm water because water affects water and as a result of that there will be a curvature of the wave small amount of spreading but just a small amount of spreading I would say when 
D is a lot bigger than wavelength, I would say that you get quite poor diffraction. It's not really good spreading out, it's a little bit of spreading out, but not fantastic diffraction. That's poor diffraction. They found this by experiment. What happens if they squeeze the gap, they made the gap smaller? And they made the gap so that the gap is about approximately the same size as the wavelength. So there is the wavelength, the distance from crest to crest. There is D. And in this particular instance, we're going to make D approximately equal. There is a symbol for approximately. Approximately equal to the wavelength. Now, by experiment, they found you get wonderful diffraction. What do I mean by wonderful, wonderful diffraction? Lovely spreading out. So the waves will spread out in lovely circular waves like that. That's what we call really good diffraction. Well, the size of the gap D is about the same size as the wavelength. Now, they used to have this debate for many years, was light, was it a wave, or was it just a series of particles? And they said, well, waves, only waves can be diffracted. So, when we pass light through a little gap, does the light spread out? Now, in the early days when they did the experiment, the light didn't spread out. That's because they could never make the gap small enough. But eventually, when they made the gap really small, they made the gap. I mean, the gap had to be, and you talked about light, it had to be something like one ten thousandth of a millimeter, 10 to the power of minus 7 meters, because that's approximately the wavelength of visible light. So that's about one ten thousandth of a millimeter. So you can imagine how small that is. You know what one millimeter is, and then one ten thousand of that. So, if you actually shine light through a gap of that size, then the light will spread out. So light does behave uh, like a wave. Now, moving on. We talked about interference in the last lesson. Now we're going to bring diffraction and interference together. And if you bring them together, if diffraction takes place, And what is diffraction? Diffraction is the spreading out of waves around corners or through gaps. And that's followed by interference. What's interference? It's about waves merging together. If those two things occur and something is capable of doing those two things, then you can say with a good degree of certainty that is a wave we're talking about. That's proof that something is a wave. Let's go back to my wave again. Here's my wave. There's the wavelength. And now let's pass it through two gaps. So you pass it through the gaps. Each gap is about the same size as the wavelength. That means I'm going to get really good diffraction. It's going to spread out like this. So two sets of waves spread out. So pass it through this gap. So a set of waves spread out. And it's coming through this another gap and a series of waves spread out. Now you have two sets of waves. And what happens with two sets of waves? They will interfere if everything about them is the same. In other words, if they came from coherent sources. Well, where are these sets of circular waves coming from? They're coming from these gaps here. So I'll call them the sources. I'll call that S1. I'll call that S2. Um, I think it's safe enough to say this, that S1 and S2 are coherent sources. In other words, everything about them is the same. Why wouldn't they be? So the waves coming out, everything about them is the same. They were generated from the same original wave. They have the same amplitude, same wavelength, same everything. And if you've got two sets of waves coming from coherent sources, what happens? 
they interfere. These waves will start to interfere. There's going to be spots along there. You see there, crest meets crest, crest meets crest. You're going to get points along there where you're going to get CI, constructive interference. You're going to get points in between where a trough and a crest meet. That's DI. And then you're going to get CI. And then you're going to get DI. You're going to get what's called an interference pattern. What you're actually going to see is, you're going to see places of very high waves, at CI. Then you're going to see DI where it's flat. Then maybe some very deep troughs, CI again. You're going to get an interference pattern. You know, if I did that with light, what would the interference pattern consist of? CI would be bright, a bright image. And DI would be no light, that would be a dark image. So if I did that experiment with light, I would see a series of bright and dark images. If I did that with sound, I would guess CI would be loud and DI would be quiet. As I walked along, I would hear high, followed by low, quiet, high. That's the interference pattern. If you have diffraction, waves spreading out, followed by interference, giving me an interference pattern, that's fantastic proof that something is a wave. Now, you see all those diagrams I did? If you look at page 46 in your notes, the space for you to do all of that. So instead of just watching the video, you're drawing those diagrams and you're getting a feel for what's going on. There's a very important demo experiment uh, at the end of page 47. And it's called Young's experiment. It's exactly what I'm talking about. So basically, if you pass light at, two, at an obstacle that has two little gaps in it, they're going to give rise to sets of waves, so we call them coherent sources. We call them S1 and S2. If you're dealing with light, you're going to have to make those gaps very, very small, about 10 to the power of minus 7 meters. Those sets of waves will spread out when they pass through the gaps. The two sets of waves will interfere. And if I hold a screen there, on that screen, I will have a series of bright images at CI, followed by dark in between, followed by bright, followed by dark. So I get a series of bright and dark images. That's an interference pattern. That is fantastic proof that light behaves as a wave. So if they ask you, uh, explain an experiment to demonstrate that light is a wave, that's Young's experiment. You need to learn your demo experiments very, very well. So I've given you a model answer at the end of page 47 as to what Young's experiment is about. Let me uh, just go through it with you because it is quite important. Young's experiment is proof that light is a wave motion. A source S of monochromatic light. Monochromatic. Mono, that word mono means one. Chrome is to do with colour. So monochromatic light means one colour. Because ordinary white light contains the colours of the rainbow, a mixture of colours. If you have monochromatic light, like pure red, you are talking about one wavelength. Whereas if you're talking about white light, which is a mixture of all the colours, you're talking about lots of different wavelengths. So monochromatic light is passed through two slits, S1 and S2, which act as coherent sources. You know what that means. Waves spread out from each slit. That's called diffraction. Anytime you give an explanation in the leaving cert, keep on using technical terms as you go along with your explanation and merge with each other, that's called interference. Bright, 
constructive interference and dark destructive interference. Images are formed on the screen. So that's a full explanation of Young's experiment to demonstrate that light is a wave. Now, with just two little gaps, you get an interference pattern. But if you actually had lots of little gaps along here, I'm talking about thousands, millions of little gaps. You're talking about lots of waves spreading out, lots of interference. Then you get a much tighter, a much nicer, a much more distinct interference pattern. That type of device that has many gaps, just moving over to this board over here, is called a diffraction grating. So if I took a piece of material and it was completely blackened out, so no light could actually get through it, and I actually cut through gaps through that, tiny little gaps that light can pass through, that's called a diffraction grating. Uh, the diffraction grating will have so many lines per millimetre or per centimetre. It's called the grating element. So you might have 5,000 lines per centimetre, or 500 lines per millimetre, or whatever. It requires some very fine engineering. Now, if you pass light through that, you'll get lots of diffraction, lots of interference, and you'll get a very, very nice interference pattern. Now, we've got to be able to do some problems with this. The distance between any two gaps, that's called D. The distance between any two lines. Now you have to be able to find D in any problem. So let's have a look at example two, which is on page 48. So in example two, they're telling me a diffraction grating consists of 500 lines per millimeter. There are 500 lines etched into that per millimeter. Well, you can imagine that would require very, very good engineering. One millimeter, 500 lines etched into it. What do they want you to find? What's the distance D between any two successive lines? This is my technique for doing this. The distance D between any two lines, if it's 500 lines per millimeter, that means between the distance between any two lines is one five hundredth of a millimeter. I want to turn that into a number in meters. Milli, page 45 in your table book, you probably already know it. A milli is 10 to the power of minus 3. So I'm going to write that down as one five hundredth multiplied by 1 by 10 to the power of minus 3 meters. So I'm going to put that into my calculator. Fraction button, 1 over 500, multiplied by 1 by 10 to the power of x, minus 3, equals, I get a fraction, so uh, press your SD button, and that will turn into scientific notation for you. And that will give me 2 by 10 to the power of minus 6 meters. That's a straightforward technique. Anytime they give you the number of lines per something, you've got to be able to turn that into a number, usually in scientific notation, in meters. Now, moving on. Let's say that's my diffraction grating. That's got lots of little lines. Draw them in there if you want, but normally don't bother. There's my diffraction grating. I'm going to pass light through that. And it's going to be monochromatic light. It might be pure red light from a laser. So that there is monochromatic light. That means it's just got one wavelength. It passes through the gaps. They spread out. They interfere. And as a result of that, you get an interference pattern formed on the screen. Now. Let me talk a little bit about that pattern. You have a number of images formed on that screen. That image in the middle, 
It's called the zero order image. We call it n equal to zero. Above it and below it, you have the first order image, which I'm going to call n equal to one. And then the second order image, n equal to two. And then the third order image, n equal to three. How long does it go on for? Well, they might ask you that. They might ask you, what's the maximum number of images? Well, we'll talk about that later. Everything above that central line and below it is symmetric. So if I folded the screen over along that line, those images above would land exactly on those below. All those images are formed at a certain angle. If I talked about n equal to 3, and I drew a line from my diffraction grating to n equal to 3, that angle there I'm going to call theta. Theta is the angle at which the third order images are formed. If I did it down below for n equal to 3, it'd be the same angle. Normally what I do is when I do these problems, I just deal with the above. If they were asking me for the total distance between n equal to 3 and n equal to 3, I would just double my answer. Now, n equal to 2 will have a different angle, n equal to 1 will have a different angle, and you can see n equal to zero. You can see what the angle there is. The angle for n equal to zero would be theta equal to zero degrees. There is a formula that brings everything together. This is a formula that you have to prove. I'm not going to prove it with you. Uh, it's actually the only proof that you have on light and sound. That proof is given on page 15 in your notes. And it just consists of a simple diagram and a little bit of maths. So you have to be able to prove that for the Leaving Cert exam. It's the only proof from the light and sound notes that you have to do. The formula that you have to prove is called n lambda equals d psi theta. Look, it's in the table book. So you can see where the formula is on page, uh, page 48. There's the diagram that I've just been drawing on the board. And any time we encounter a formula, I write down exactly where it is in the table book. It's on page 59 in the table book. You should colour those in in yellow mark or something like that. I know you can't bring the table book into the exam with you, but you can familiarise yourself with where all the relevant information is. Because your table book, you know, has a huge amount of information in it, and you probably only need about 10% of that information for the Leaving Cert exam. You know what everything stands for. N stands for the number of the image, or the order of the image. N is a whole natural number. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Lambda, that's the wavelength of your monochromatic light. Remember what D is. It's the distance between any two lines in your diffraction grating. We just did a problem on that back there. And theta is the angle at which the images are formed. Let's do two examples. So let's go to example three, which is on uh, page 49. So a diagram is given, uh, diffraction grating having 80 lines per millimetre. Well the first thing you've got to do is you've got to turn that into D, don't you? So D is equal to 80 lines per millimetre. What's my technique? The distance between any two lines is 1 80th of a millimetre. Turn that into 1 80th by 1 by 10 to the power of minus 3 meters. Put that into my calculator and I have a value for t. So 
y get 1.25 by 10 to the power of minus 5 meters. Let me use this diagram here. We're talking about just going to adding to 2. So they're calling, they're calling them by letters A, B, C, and D. So this here is A, B, C, D, and E. Let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that. And let me draw a line from there to there. And I'll call that theta now. Okay, there's a new situation for this particular example. They're telling me in this particular example that the diffraction grating and the screen, they're 2.5 meters apart. But that distance there is 2.5 meters. They also tell me what the wavelength is. They tell me that the wavelength of the light from the monochromatic source is 620 nanometers. Let me write that down. Lambda is 620 nanometers. Now, you have to be very good with the units in the leading cert. Nano is a prefix. Hard to remember what it is. You shouldn't have to remember what they are. Go to page 45 in your table book. And it will tell you that nano, n, is equal to 10 to the power of minus 9. So what you do is you replace the nano by 10 to the power of minus 9. So it's 620 by 10 to the power of minus 9 meters. You know, that's not perfect scientific notation. Perfect scientific notation, the number is between, the first number is between 1 and 10. But you can leave it like that if you want. It doesn't make any difference. But if you do want to turn it into perfect scientific notation, you can put it into your calculator 620 by 10 to the power of x minus 9 equals, and I will tell you, that 6.2 by 10 to the power of minus 7 meters. But you don't have to do that. If you left it like that, perfectly okay. What are they asking me to do? They're asking me to find the distance AE. The distance from the n equal to 2 above down to the n equal to 2 below. Look, any time we do these problems, just do the above part and then you can double it to find the distance below because everything above is the same as everything below. And by doing that, you just have to work with right angle triangles. You don't have to use any cosine rules or anything like that. You can see, I want the angle for image A. That's n equal to 2. So I have another number. I have n equal to 2. Now, look what I have. I've got d, lambda, and n. If I have a look at my formula, there's four things in my formula. N, lambda, d. The only thing I'm missing is theta. So now I'm able to find out theta from that. If I was to write sine theta on its own, sine theta is equal to n lambda divided by d. What's theta equal to? The backward sine or the inverse sine of n lambda over d. So theta is the inverse sine of n lambda divided by d. It's the inverse sine of, let me put my numbers in, n is 2, lambda 6.2 by 10 to the power of minus 7. And d, 1.25 by 10 to the power of minus 5. So let me put that into my calculator exactly as it is. Make sure, of course, your calculator is in degrees. It's a d on the top and not an r for radians. So shift, sine, fraction, top, 2 by 6.2 by 10 to the power of x minus 7. Scroll down to the bottom, 1.25. by 10 to the power of x, minus 5. Close the bracket. 
I get 5.69, let's say one decimal place, I'll say 5.7 degrees. That gives me the angle. Now I'm going to do some simple trigonometry. Some simple trigonometry that will allow me to work out the distance from A to E, but because I'm just dealing with this top part of it here, I'm just going to find the distance AC from A down to C, and then double my answer. That's the best way to do it. If I was to draw that right angle triangle that I've Shade it in. Here it is over here. There's the base, 2.5 meters. That's the distance I'm looking for, isn't it? That'll be point A there, and that'll be point C. Maybe for now, let's, but you can call it AC, or you can call it X if you want. The unknown. That angle of teach I've worked out, and I got 5.7 degrees. So you're going to use one of your trig functions, sine, cos, tan. What did I use? Looks like tan to me, doesn't it? I'm looking for the opposite. I've got the adjacent. So I'm going to say the tan of 5.7 degrees is equal to the opposite x divided by the adjacent 2.5. Slide the 2.5 up, so x is equal to 2.5 times the tan of 5.7 degrees. Remember you're going to have to double that. So you could actually make that 5, couldn't you? You could multiply it by 2 now. Well, let's do it as we were doing it. So put that into my calculator. 2.5 times tan 5.7 degrees. Well, I get 0.249, looks about 0.25. So x is equal to 0.25 meters. Now remember, we want the total distance, don't we? I've worked out that distance x, which is AC there. The total distance is from A to E, which would be double that. So my answer, which is the distance AE, that's 2 times 0.25, which is 0.5 meters. You know, I suppose that's one of the more difficult questions they could actually ask you on that. Let's just finish this lesson with one more question that they ask. It's example number four. So let me go over to this board here. And do example four. Remember I talked about earlier um, how many images are formed in total? Like they go on and on forever. Well, they don't go on and on forever. So the question that they ask you is, what's the maximum number of images formed? So example four. A diffraction gratient has 500 lines per millimetre. Well, you have to work out D from that. That's one five hundredth of a millimetre. Actually, that's exactly the same example that we did in example two. The answer is 2 by 10 to the power of minus 6 metres. The light has a wavelength, lambda, of 6 by 10 to the power of minus 7 metres. How many images will be formed altogether? Well, here's the technique for doing this. The number of images formed altogether. You know, when you put sine theta into your calculator, you'll always get a number between 0 and 1, or minus 1 as well. But from 0 to 1, the maximum value of sine theta is 1. So the maximum value Sine theta 
is equal to 1. So if I want to find out how many images there are in total, I'm going to put sine theta equal to its maximum value. So here's my formula. My formula is n lambda is equal to d sine theta. If I want to find the total number of images, then I'm going to put that sine theta equal to 1. So my formula now becomes n lambda is equal to d, because sine theta is 1. Now n stands for the number of each image, so I'm actually looking for n. So I'm going to write n on its own, so n is equal to d divided by lambda. Let me use my values over there. d is 2 by 10 to the power of minus 6, and lambda is 6 by 10 to the power of minus 7. So I'm going to put that into my calculator. Fraction button, 2 by 10 to the power of minus 6, divided by 6 by 10 to the power of minus 7, equals, press the SD button, and I get about 3.3. You know about n? n has to be a whole number. You can't have a bit of an image. So what I've got to do is I've got to round that number, but you're always going to round it down. For example, if that number ended up being 3.9, you don't round it up to 4. You round it down to 3. You round it to the next whole number down below it. So in this particular case, the highest image you want to get is n equal to 3. Now they're asking how many images. So if I just go back over here, if I was talking about n equal to 3, that means there'll be 1, 2, 3 above, that's 3. There'll be 1, 2, 3 below, that's 3 more. And don't forget the n equal to 0 right in the middle. So in if n is equal to 3 is my highest image, highest order image, then I've got 7 images altogether. 3 above, 3 below, and n equal to 0 in the middle. So my answer there <coughs> is the total number of images is 7 images. I suppose what do you do? You multiply by 2 and you add 1. So if n is equal to 40, the number of images would be... 81. Okay, so that's the end of that lesson, so thanks very much. Okay, so let's move on to lesson number four, where we're going to do some more diffraction plus some dispersion thrown in. Uh, we're talking about page 53 now in our notes. You've all talked about the prism, where you pass white light. White light is, contains all the colours. When you pass white light through a prism, uh, by refraction, all the different colours in the white light, they will all bend by slightly different amounts. So you can separate out the colours. You can separate out the colours of the rainbow. The colours of the rainbow are written down there. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. All I care really for the higher level leaving cert is the extremes, the ones on the edges. Red, and violet and everything else is in between so that there is the visible light in your electromagnetic spectrum so I've got red at one end and I have violet at the other when we talk about red light red light has a longer wavelength than violet light that means violet light has more energy because you can see it's got more waves per second. So it's more dangerous if you like. That's very close to ultraviolet light, which causes sun tanning. Whereas red is a lot weaker. So if you have a low frequency, a low number of waves per second, then you have a long wavelength, distance from crest to crest, and therefore the wave is not very energetic. Whereas violet, which I've drawn as blue here, but we're talking about violet, it's a shorter wavelength, more waves per second, and therefore has more energy in it. It's more dangerous. So I can use a prism to break up white light into its different colours, the colours of the rainbow. 
That's called dispersion. So we have a definition of dispersion. My definition of dispersion is nice and easy. It's the breaking up of light into its colours. Now, they probably won't ask you about the prism uh, to cause dispersion uh, for the higher level. They'll ask you to do it some other way. There is another way that you can break the white light up into its colours. And that's using a diffraction grating. So here we go again. There's my diffraction grating with lots and lots of little lines etched into that material. And I'm going to pass white light through it. And the white light goes through it. Now I'm no longer talking about monochromatic light. You know, if that was pure red, I'd have red images there. If that was pure blue, I'd have blue images there. But what happens now if I've got white, which is a mixture of the colours of the rainbow, every colour from red down to violet? What do I get? Well, what you get is this. You will get a rainbow in n equal to 1. So there's n equal to 1. And I will get an entire rainbow in there. I will get a rainbow here at n equal to 1. I will get another rainbow at n equal to 2. Another rainbow at n equal to 2. How many rainbows do I get? Well, you know how to work that out from example 4. How do you work out the maximum number of images? But right here, n equal to 0, I don't get a rainbow. I actually get white light. All the colours fall in the same spot. In other words, they don't separate. If all the colours fall in the same spot, you see white. And why is that? Well, you know that n equal to 0 occurs at an angle of theta is equal to 0 degrees. So here's my formula. n lambda is equal to d sine theta. Well, think about this. In white light, I've got all these different wavelengths. But at n equal to 0, if you multiply it by 0, they all land at theta equal to 0 degrees. There's no separation. So at n equal to 0, you will see white light. And at n equal to 1, n equal to 2, you will see the rainbows. So if they asked you how many rainbows there were, you wouldn't be adding on the n equal to 0, zero in the centre. In those rainbows, which way is the rainbow? In other words, is red up there or is red down there? Let me think about how to work that out. I do know this from over here, that red has a longer wavelength than violet or blue. And I'm going to use that now to try and work out where red is. So think about this. I'm going to write down sine theta on its own. Sine theta is equal to n lambda divided by d. How does sine theta work? Well, actually, as theta goes up, that implies sine theta goes up. So if I put sine 10 into my calculator, then sine 20, sine 30, sine 40, well, the sine of those values keeps on going up and up and up. Cos actually does the opposite. As theta goes up, cos theta goes down. But with sine theta, as theta goes up, sine theta also goes up. Now, think about red. Red has a longer wavelength than violet. So, think about that there is going to be a bigger number. If there's a bigger number on top, the whole fraction will be bigger. It's equal to sine theta, sine theta will be bigger, and therefore theta will be bigger. So that means red is formed at a bigger, a larger angle than blue. So if it's formed at a longer, bigger angle, there's 
my red, that would be on top. Violet has a smaller wavelength, smaller number, smaller fraction, smaller sine theta, smaller theta. That means that violet is going to be formed at a smaller angle. See that red line is at a bigger angle to the horizontal than that blue line to the horizontal. So in my rainbow, red will be on top, violet will be on the bottom. What about down below? My rainbows will turn upside down because if red is at a bigger angle, then we're talking about a bigger angle to the horizontal. That means red is going to finish down there. Bigger angle, so there is red, and blue or violet will finish there. So the rainbows are actually upside down, below the horizontal. Now let me have a look at example 5, which is on page 54. I'll do it on this board over here. Example 5 says monochromatic red light. Now we're talking about pure red light. We're not talking about white. White is a mixture of the colours. And if I pass white light through my diffraction grating, you get dispersion. In other words, you get rainbows formed. You could do it with a prism, but on the higher level, even cert, we'll, we talk more about using a diffraction grating to do dispersion. Uh, what is the effect, if any, on the separation of the images if the screen was moved nearer the grating? They're asking me this question here. What's the effect on the separation of those images if I moved the screen in closer? Well, if you think about that, and you can see it's actually laid out for you in your example. If you move the screen in closer, you're actually going to be intercepting the images uh, earlier and therefore those images are going to be closer together. So if I just move that screen in closer, there's my red images being formed, you move it in closer, uh, the images are going to be closer together. So that's just common sense. Uh, what's not common sense are the next two parts, so I've got to use a little bit of uh, mathematics. What would happen if the separation of the lines on the grating were reduced. The separation of the lines on the grating. In other words, they are now closer together. So we're now talking about D, the distance between any two lines, getting smaller. So if D gets smaller, what happens to those images? Do they get closer together or are they further apart? Well, I'm going to write down sine theta is equal to n lambda divided by d. Now ask yourself, what happens when d gets smaller? When d gets smaller, that means you're going to be dividing by a smaller number. If you divide by a smaller number, that overall number becomes bigger. If that becomes bigger, theta becomes bigger. If theta becomes bigger, they are further apart. They're formed at bigger angles. So if d goes down, that implies theta goes up. And the answer is the images are further apart. The next part, part C. They say, what happens if blue light was used instead of red light. Well, blue light is close to violet, so blue light has a smaller wavelength. They tell me that, but they might tell you that in the exam. I'm not sure if they will or they won't. If I use blue light instead of red light, well, I'm talking about having a smaller wavelength. That means lambda is going down. What effect does that have on theta? If theta gets bigger, they'll be further apart, if the pieces get smaller, they'll be closer together. So I'll have a look at my formula here. What happens if that lambda on top gets smaller? If that gets smaller, the overall fraction gets smaller. 
sine theta gets smaller, theta gets smaller. That means theta will go down. If theta goes down, that means they are closer together. Right, let's move on and do a leading cert question. The leading cert question I'm going to do is... Let's find it now. I'm going to do leading cert 2009, which is in on page 130 in your notes. It's a full question. Question 7. So I'll be talking in the next lesson about the breakdown of section B. But this is a full 56 mark question. You've got to do 5 of these out of 8 in section B. Look, it starts off, it's some nice easy stuff. They give you a sentence and they ask you to define two things. They ask you to define diffraction and dispersion. Look, that's you just doing your mundane work, learning your definitions. 12 marks, learn your definitions, put them in. Next part is also kind of boring mundane stuff. They ask you to prove that diffraction formula. N lambda is equal to D sine theta. So I told you about the proof earlier on. You just have to learn it. And now we get on to the intelligent part of the question. You know, I can't really do all that kind of boring, mundane stuff for you in terms of learning definitions. You've got to do that yourself. Get that into your head. What I really want to do here is do the intelligent stuff and explain that to you. So here's the intelligent stuff. An interference pattern is formed on the screen when green light... Actually, I don't have green light, so I'll just put it in black... Passes normally, you know what normally means? At right angles through a diffraction grating. The grating has 80 lines per millimeter. What's the first thing you do when you see 80 lines per millimeter? I work out D. D is 180th of a millimeter, 180th by 1 by 10 to the power of minus 3. Put that into your calculator, I think we did it earlier, and I get 1.25 by 10 to the power of minus 5 meters. That's a very basic skill. What else does it say? Uh, the distance from the grating to the screen is 90 centimeters. That distance there is 90 centimeters. If I change that to meters, I'll see later on. The distance between the third order images, there's 0, 1, 2, 3, so there's n equal to 3, and there's n equal to 3, and that distance is 23.8 centimetres. Remember what I said, you know, just do the top half, it's exactly symmetric. There is n to 3, there is the theta of the angle. So basically, I just want to write down what that is. So the distance between n to 3 on top and n to 3 down there is 23.8 centimetres. So put that into your calculator and divide by 2. So I get 11.9 centimetres. What are they asking me to do? In this particular example, they're asking me to find the wavelength of the light. What information do I have? Well, I know that n is equal to 3. Because what formula am I going to use? I'm going to be using our famous formula that you have to prove. They asked you to prove in the previous part. N lambda is equal to D sine theta. So I know N. I know D. They're asking me to find lambda. And I don't have theta yet. But you know, I could find theta from some simple trigonometry. I mean, there's a right angle triangle there. I've got the opposite side, don't I? And I have the adjacent side. So I could do tan. I could say tan theta 
is equal to the opposite. Actually, I'll leave everything in centimetres. They're both in centimetres, it makes no difference because I'm going to divide them. So 11.9 divided by the adjacent 90. That means theta is the inverse tan of 11.9 divided by 90. So let me put that into my calculator. So that's how I'm going to get the angle in this particular problem. Shift tan, fraction, 11.9 divided by 90. And I get, say, 7.53 degrees. You know, my kind of rule of thumb is, you know, that's not my final answer. I might go two decimal places as I lead up to my final answer. And when I get to my final answer, I'll probably do it, round it off to one decimal place. But like, they never tell you uh, on the leaving cert uh, how many decimal places, unlike the maths paper. So basically, what you do is up to you. It can't really mark you down. So now, I think I have enough information, don't I? I have N, that's 3, lambda I need to find, D, worked it out, theta just worked it out, so let me work out lambda, so lambda is equal to, slide the N down, D sine theta, divided by N, D, 1.25, by 10 to the power of minus 5, by the sine of 7.53 degrees divided by 3. So put that into my calculator. And I get, say, 5.46. Well, you can go two decimal places, so you can go 1, 5.5, 5.46 by 10 to the power of minus 7 meters. So that's my answer to part 1. Part 2. They're asking me to find the maximum number of images. Well, we know this technique, don't we? to find the maximum number of images. In my formula here, the maximum value of sine theta is one. So you end up with n lambda is equal to d, and then write that down in terms of n. n is equal to d divided by lambda. d is 1.25 by 10 to the power of minus five, Lambda is, just worked it out, 5.46 by 10 to the power of minus 7. So put that into your calculator. And remember, we're going to round it down to the nearest whole number. So I guess, say, 22.9. You don't round that up to 23, sure you don't? We never quite made 23 images above, so I'm going to write down the value of n is 22. How many images? So that's what they're asking me for. They're asking me for the maximum number of images. Well, 22 above, 22 below, and don't forget about the n equal to 0 in the middle. So the number of images, multiply by 2 and add 1, and I get 45 images. Let's see what else they're asking over the page. Page 131. They're saying, the laser is replaced with a source of white light and a series of spectra, also called rainbows, are formed on the screen. So, you've got to explain how the diffraction gradient produces a spectrum. 
Now, I could have talked about it earlier over here. I mean, basically, every single color has a different wavelength. And therefore, each wavelength will be formed at a different angle. And that means the red will be formed at a different angle to the violet. So you've got to explain that uh, in your explanation. If you want a nice explanation, you can look in the solutions. And then the last part, they're asking the question, why a spectrum is not formed at the central order image? So why is one not formed here? So we talked about that earlier as well. You know, n is equal to zero. So it doesn't really matter what the wavelength is. When you multiply it by zero, the angles for all those colors will be theta equal to zero, which means they'll all land at the same spot. That means they're not separated. If they all land at the same spot, what do you see? You see white. Okay, so I'll leave it there for this particular lesson. So thanks very much.